welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, I'm delighted that my guest today is somebody we've had on the show before. Frank Ferredi is the Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Kent. He's the author of numerous critically acclaimed books. When he was on last time, we were talking about his book, How Fear Works. This time, he has a new book out. Uh, it's just come out, which is called Why Borders Matter, Why Humanity Must Relearn the Art of Drawing Boundaries. Uh, thanks for joining us again, uh, Frank. Um, when people hear about, when, when usually on this program we're talking about borders, it means just one thing, um, and that is national borders. But yeah. can you just give us an, an overview that your book is about something much wider than that? Yeah. Uh, basically what happened was that uh, I was asked to do the introduction to the Philosophy Day in Holland on the, pub, on the on the subject of borders. And when I began to look into giving this lecture, I realized that not only were national borders uh, being contested and called into question, people were saying borders are somehow evil or immoral or exploitative, but every border and every boundary uh, that has been important in giving meaning to human experience is now seen as somehow discriminatory or immoral. So the border between uh, children and adults is now seen in a highly uh, sort of dubious kind of a way. And the symbolic boundary separating children from adults is often called into question. You probably will have heard all the debate about the conventional uh, boundary between men and women. And people now see that's an unfair distinction between men and women. There must be a whole lot of other sexes that are not taken into account. Uh, we now call into question the boundary between human beings and animals and argue that in fact, you know, uh, there is a lot more similarity between some animals and humans than we suspect. The border between uh, the public and private is being uh, pulverized and gradually you cannot make any more distinctions. And what became very, very clear to me is that any form of important cultural distinction uh, that has given meaning to human experience is now being contested. And that's how the book came about. I'm trying to uh, explain the connections between why it is that precisely the same people that call for open borders are also the same people that query uh, the conventional distinction between men and women mm. and are uncomfortable with the distinction between the private and the public. I mean, there is a sort of uh, paradox, is there not, at the heart of this, is that you've got this desire for what you might call openness, no borders. On the other hand, we seem to be living in a more and more prescriptive time. I mean, that's yes. a paradox. It's a paradox, and it's something that I, I address because what's very interesting is that the, the, the kind of people that denounce the policing of border and they say it's violent and it's unjust and that should never happen in a civilized society are also the same the same people who are very busy policing culture so you have this new movement uh, against cultural appropriation where people are continually uh, sort of scrutinizing who is wearing what kind of haircut mm. you know is is a white person uh, allowed to write about a native american or a a man, can a man write about a woman? And all these identity cultural groups are policing one another to make sure that you don't infringe on that. So you have this interesting development where, and I make this point is that you know, the people that are against you know, distinctions are only against the distinctions that are rooted in the past, are only against the distinctions that have given meaning to human experience over the centuries. They've created their own ways of protecting themselves. I think the most striking example is that in the United States, there's been this tremendous hostility to Trump building that wall on the Mexican-American border. And you think, well, the people who were hostile to walls and borders, you know, would be open to everything. But they are the same people who are continually agitating for safe spaces. Mm. They want to have their own safe space where they're 
uh, in a sense, kind of cut off from criticism, immunized from being offended. So there is a kind of uh, interesting parallel going on here, a double standard where some borders are attacked. And these are the borders that I think are really important. And the new ones, which are very personal, very private identity based, they're kind of uh, recreated as, as the new kind of borders that uh, are legitimate from their point of view. Do you, do you feel, Frank, that you would, you, would it be right to say that you are therefore pro borders in the nation state sense? Well, it was a bit of a journey of discovery because historically I always presumed in favor of openness of allowing as much movement and migration as possible. I myself come from an immigrant family, so I'm quite sympathetic to people having to uh, have the freedom of movement. Uh, but what I'm against and what I've learned is a really big problem is, is when the very idea of a border is called into question. And the reason for that is because we need national borders uh, uh, as a way of, of creating communities. I think one of the things we learn from history is that communities are banded in space. You know, for, right from the Greeks onward, we learn that the walls of the city state provided the context within which public life could occur, where citizens could trust each other and engage with each other. And similarly today, we need national borders in order for democracy to function, in order for public life to work, because yeah. unless we have citizens uh, who are being able to uh, hold to account the political system, we're in big trouble. And who are citizens? Well, the citizens aren't world citizens, kind of living in the abstract, although some people would claim it'd be much better if we were all citizens of the world. They're actually citizens of a particular space uh, where they've, uh, over the centuries, been generationally created and where there are links and responsibilities uh, that people, citizens, have towards the generations that preceded them and the ones that come after that. And even immigrants who decide to become immigrant um, citizens, when they come to a country, they still become at that point bounded. And in a, in a moral sense, they become part and parcel of that kind of uh, community that exists within those borders. So it's right to say, isn't it, that obviously when you started out politically, Frank, and the, with the, when you founded the Revolutionary Communist Party, uh, the, I would have thought the whole basis of that international Marxism was total internationalism, no borders. Um, it has been a gradual, what, what changed? Has this been a gradual journey for you to, to, this, to this belief now? Or? Well, I think that there's often been a lot of confusion on this, both by the left, by Marxists, and uh, people who are sympathetic to what I see as being a universalist aspiration. I think the German philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, quite rightly talked about universalism as being a positive development and, and, and quite rightly he talked about the need for humankind to see themselves as, as having something common that's very precious and needs to be preserved and therefore as, as members of a, of a human species we do have a, a degree of responsibility for each other on the moral plane. Mm. But at the same time as we have that, we also aren't just simply human beings. Mm. We're people that are born into a particular family. We're people that are born into a particular community. We have neighbors, we have family members. We belong to a particular nation. And therefore, uh, whilst morally, we take responsibility for the whole of the human species, we have a different relationship with those who, to whom we are accountable, the ones that are part and parcel of the space that we inhabit. And I, it seems to me that once you begin to understand the situation like that, you can be both generous in terms of uh, uh, kind of being committed to the freedom of movement while taking very, very seriously the nation state national boundaries, especially today when there is so much of an attempt to destroy uh, the sense of national commitments and national identity, we have to uh, bend the stick in a different kind of direction than would have been the case in the past. Do you think, uh, you know, one can believe in uh, 
freedom of movement, if you like, in a broad principle sense, uh, I suppose. But would you say, therefore, that, for example, the historic mass migration that, say, Europe has been seeing and Britain has been seeing, would you say that that, therefore, must, therefore, be destructive to the idea of community and borders? Well, I think it's the, the situation is a little bit more complicated than that. The way that I look at it is that, obviously, people in a particular community have got the right to make a decision and decide you know, whether they want migration or not. You know, it, it's their responsibility. They have the authority to have the final say mm. on how, how the whole system should work. But to me, the real problem uh, with migration is not migration per se. Yeah. I think the real problem is that uh, in places like Britain, in France, Belgium, many parts of Western Europe, we have a, a regime of multiculturalism. Mm. And what multiculturalism does and what it says is basically uh, you can come into our society, you can come into our community, and you can decide on what terms you want to live there. You don't have to be like us. You don't have to be part and parcel of a, com of a, a common community. And under those circumstances, what multiculturalism does is it corrodes the nations into which migrants and immigrants come into, because instead of forging a, a sense of unity and, and deciding and discussing what is it that we have in common, yeah. the question doesn't get raised. Instead, people are told, well, you live your life in accordance with your, your culture. You know, we'll live our own life in the way that we see fit. And you end up with a lot of parallel worlds and parallel societies. And that is what is destructive. It's the, to me, the real problem is multiculturalism rather than simply you know, uh, the, you know, people coming in. Because if people came into Britain on different terms, they knew they had to learn English. They knew they had to be British. Mm. They knew that they had to sign up to the values that you know, sort of were part and parcel of our history. Uh, then the problem would be very different. So it's the response, really, isn't it, of countries like ours to immigration, which is the problem. I mean, uh, there's a, just to before we leave this part of it, there's also a problem, surely, that with multiculturalism, um, you also have a, an established country which might not even believe necessarily anymore in imposing, actually, what would be the, the culture, the national culture. In other words, you hear that in a crude sense this idea of signing up to to the culture you're living in. That's very weak, that, that, that feeling now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously the reason why we have multiculturalism in its, in its form, because uh, the uh, political establishment in Britain, the cultural establishment, uh, is very uneasy mm. with the traditions of, of, the, of, of Britain, with the history of Britain, with the kind of values that made Britain what it is, and is much more uh, comfortable about trying to uh, sort of move away from that. And, and in fact, often uses immigration as a medium through which uh, sort of new values can be imported and, and, and celebrated. And I think it's very often the case that uh, if you know, if you if you kind of look at uh, the, the uh, Netflix or Hollywood or the BBC in terms of what is valued mm. in in the world, it's almost never the case that what is valued are are kind of authentic mm. English or Scottish or Welsh kind of values. Mm. What is what is celebrated is some kind of you know kind of confused mixture of cosmopolitan. You know, sort of fashion that it, that is the latest, uh, you know, sort of fad, uh, and 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 it, and to that extent, they have got no interest in in, in creating a, a more homogenized political culture. In fact, what they celebrate is not the homogenized political culture, but what they call diversity. Mm. And what diversity means is, you know, you know, the, the more the merrier. Uh, difference is inherently good, and uh, under those circumstances. Yes, so we do run into uh, a bit of a problem. What you're talking about, it seems to me, really, is, is was very well illustrated by the Brexit argument um, and indeed by this notion that I think David Goodhart talked about of anywheres and somewheres. You, anywheres are the people who are the citizens of the world and 
almost take take you know celebrate the fact they have no roots they want to be rootless and the somewheres are the people who have a sense of lo locality and attachment you'd say that that is pretty much uh, really what you're actually talking about isn't it as well yeah I, I, to, to a considerable extent you do have people who uh, pride themselves on the fact that they continually on the move yeah they boast about the fact that they feel just as home in Hollywood as they do in Paris or in Berlin. Yeah. And they, you know, sort of uh, kind of cultivate this cosmopolitan image uh, whereby they have, you know, they, they kind of haven't got the sensibilities. Uh, they, they don't really take seriously the customs of the com cultures into which they were born. And uh, it is interesting to know that these people who are so ruthless, the anywheres, at the same time, when you kind of scratch the surface, are totally obsessed about about space as well. Mm. But it's not the space into which they were born into, it's their personal space. Mm. Mm. And in the book I talk about how, uh, particularly in the United States, you now have this obsession with personal boundaries mm. and with personal spaces that somehow you need to keep people at a distance from you. You've got this very privatized notion of space and if you go on Amazon, there are dozens and dozens of self-help book, books that advise you how to defend your personal space, how to you know, kind of maintain your private sphere. So, you know, even though they're very comfortable anywhere in the world, they actually aren't totally relaxed uh, because they feel exposed by the world they live in. And they are trying, to, you know, in an escapist way, move away, but at the same time, try to create some kind of a personal safe space for themselves, you know, where they can, this, they can be distant from the rest of the world. There is a sort of, I feel, uh, a slight moral superiority attached to this too, that somehow you are, you are better person for wanting to be basically itinerant, you know, that this shows something about you. It, it does, and I, and I think it, it kind of comes across in the most condescending way in the United States, where you often hear people saying, oh, most Americans haven't got a passport. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, they don't travel to mm -hmm. the south of France or to Mallorca like we do. And, you know, I, I, I love traveling, so I've got no problems with going all over the place. But if, you know, just because people don't have passports and they haven't been to Benidorm doesn't really mean that they're morally inferior. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same people who think in this way that have this sense of moral superiority always use the same expression. You always know what they think because they think of themselves as being aware. And and they think that, you know, they're in a position to raise our awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because they got this kind of special moral insight into the world. And what it is, is basically what they're saying is that our ruthless values that is not bounded in space that is not contained within the conventional uh, sort of symbolic boundaries is somehow superior mm. than those poor little people mm. who actually you know sort of enjoy being english somehow there's something wrong about these people when they wave an english flag you know sort of it's okay for them to wave their flags because I mean, they got their equivalent you know of what a flag is but it's not okay for an english person to wave uh, a flag. So I always make the point that, you know, whenever my friends who are these uh, cosmopolitan uh, types who think they are really aware, you know, I always make the point that you kind of look down upon people waving a national flag, but look how much you're waving your rainbow flags mm. all the time and, and how, how you think that that is so much a symbol of moral authority, where in fact, all you're doing is just branding yourself in a slightly different way. Your uh, book is extremely thorough about almost the whole human experience in terms of borders. Uh, so, you, as you say, as you said at the beginning, about men and women, about adults and children. Uh, when it comes to adults and children, there, it seems, and I think you point this out, that there is on the one hand a kind of infantilization process going on with adults, isn't there? And I suppose what would the what would the parallel one be with children? They're being 
what they're being made into adults or, or or what how on a daily basis would you see that working frank you know how would you see what would an illustration of that be well, well a very good example of the what i call the adultification of children when they're kind of treated like not only adults but also as in some shape or form morally superior to an adult mm. is when a really cool yummy mummy goes shopping with her daughter and instead of the mother telling the daughter what clothes to buy she asks her daughter what should i wear you know make a suggestion the daughter tells the mother how to dress mm -hmm. and it's when you get the yummy daddies you know boasting about the fact that they wear the same t-shirts as their sons mm -hmm. and they listen to the same music as their children they really lo love the fact mm -hmm. that their their children's best friends instead of their dads and their moms you know that mm -hmm. you're in you really are in trouble you know when that occurs and i think that the most grotesque way in which children have become adultified and and adults have become infantilized is when you look at extinction rebellion where you have someone like greta thunberg being put on this pedestal as this moral authority mm. who's entitled yeah. to lecture these horrible adults who have made the world so bad for little 14 15 year olds and instead of saying, well, get off the pedestal, Greta, and you know, do your homework, instead of you know, sort of doing what adults have always done, you know, you, they basically take the knee in front of her and, and kind of ask her whether she's, you know, she wants to get a Nobel Peace Prize or something like that. So there is a kind of uh, what I call socialization in reverse, where the relationship between adults and children, at least morally, are often reversed. And the boundary goes completely between adult authority and children but this is something that you see to be global it seems to me that this is almost entirely a western thing uh you know america britain the english-speaking part of the world is this really the case in other cultures I mean, what i what i'm thinking of frank is that where there is still a strong religious structure for example or moral structure this doesn't really occur so much does it I think this is very, very strong uh, in the West. Uh, it's particularly powerful in the Anglo-American sphere and in Northern Europe, mm -hmm. the Scandinavian countries. Uh, it's less less so the case in Spain, uh, in Greece, and in the Mediterranean countries. And of course, uh, thankfully, much of Central Europe and uh, East Europe and the Balkans have been immunized from this. But I, I, I think it's important not to be complacent because in my travels I've noted that these kinds of ideals uh, percolate through uh, what I call American or soft power. Mm. You have to remember that people watch Netflix everywhere, mm. all over the world, China, India, East Europe. Mm. And you watch a Netflix program and I can bet you my 10 pounds against your pound that in that Netflix program, the child will come across as sensitive, mm. morally superior mm. to this to the dissolute, you know, sort of bad tempered adults. There's a kind of message that comes across almost subliminally. Mm. And I think for that reason, you'll find that increasingly amongst the middle classes in Shanghai or amongst the middle classes in Osaka or Tokyo, some of this uh, kind of cultural sensibility is also becoming quite influential, quite powerful. And, and, and therefore, um, unfortunately, uh, even those societies that have a, a more sturdy, confident cultural outlook, uh, even they are susceptible to internalizing yeah. some of this. Uh, uh. Do you think that, uh, you know, moving on to the points you make about the public and private sphere uh, in adult behavior, or indeed in, in young people's behavior. Do you think that there is uh, anything in the idea that younger people have essentially given up their privacy? They, you know, that they don't mind this blurring. They don't see any distinction. They're quite happy to put it all out there on social media. Is, is that where that's come from? No, well, I think the younger people are the, are, are the beneficiaries, if you want to use that word, of the dissolute behavior of their uh, adults, uh, kind of predecessors. I think 
it's been happening for a few generations now that the private sphere often is seen as a, a very dark, bad space and where stoicism or the stiff upper lip or trying to take your family too seriously and 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 close the door and 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 speak in ways to members of your family that's different to the rest of the world those things are seen as negative for a very very long time and i remember as far back as 1990 being involved in a debate where we were arguing about this emotionalism that was really kicking in which then acquired its most uh, caricatured form when princess diana died mm. and yet this national outpouring of grief where people were competing with one another uh, as to who is most upset people crying in public and where i remember when prince charles i think was criticized for uh, not crying in public and, and and having this stiff upper lip as somehow that was uh, morally inferior to what good people did so this has been going on for a very very long time and the present generation with their social media have inherited a world where there is no value attached to private life there's no value attached to being on your own in fact the value that is attached is to people who open up in public you know the reality tv format where politicians freely talk about their mental health problems their alcoholism the, their faithlessness with their partners their sexual problems where they can talk about anything and the more you talk about the more private the thoughts are that you reveal the more you're praised for being brave mm -hmm. right? you know you, the more you're yeah. seen as a genuine authentic politician and if you're a politician that says no actually i'm not here to talk about my mental health issues i'm here to talk about policies and what i've done that is seen as somehow a blemish on their record so we have created a world where private life you know sort of its uh, important conventional senses has got no real uh, moral authority attached to it but increasingly seen as a as something negative you know in privacy you beat up your partner you abuse your children in privacy the families distort the uh, the well-being of, of kids so in that sense open the door you know that's the argument open the door because they don't trust you and the, and the idea of a closed door has now become a metaphor for something negative something depraved and you'll find very often that there are books called the they got the, the, the word closed door in the title and they always signify that there's something uh, disgusting or degrading taking place behind that closed door what effect do you think frank has this whole covid episode had on the idea of borders i mean here we are you know in the you know socially distant time we are and you know people are being stopped from traveling and all this uh what what do you see as being the effect this will have on the phenomenon that you're writing about yeah it is it is very very interesting because um uh, on the one hand, uh, what the lockdown did was to uh, reinforce this kind of sensibility uh, that uh, is very much concerned with safe spaces, mm -hmm. that very much wants to have this kind of personal boundary around you all the time. And I think uh, a lot of people, you know, who are against national borders, but who like safe spaces, were also the people that loved being in lockdown and weren't particularly bothered by it mm. and are usually the ones that are um, less comfortable about leaving home mm. you know when the lockdown is finished so for them the lockdown was not ex an experience that was negative it was something that corresponded to their pre-covid kind of sensibility so you, you have that on the one hand but on the other hand what you also have is that uh, because of this uh, global upheaval because of this terrible epidemic, we become conscious of the fact, you know, that borders do matter. Mm. We become conscious of the fact that not just national borders matter, but the border between Lombardy and the rest of Italy mm. is really quite important. Mm. And we we now are in a situation where all of a sudden we realize that even though we're uh, part of the same human race, nevertheless. You know, there are very different experiences and different cultural reactions which correspond very much to borders and boundaries so it kind of has reinforced 
uh, perhaps the, 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 the strength of that. But nevertheless, the bad news is, is that what COVID-19 has done is it's reinforced many of the regressive cultural tendencies to do with symbolic boundaries. And the example that I want to bring to your attention, which occurred after I finished writing the book, it would happen before I would have written a chapter on it, is the way in which in recent weeks, the boundary between the present and the past mm. you know, is being called into question. Mm. Where all of a sudden, you know, sort of thousands of people are trying to uh, sort of fix the problems of the past by going around and toppling statues. Mm all of a sudden you know people are you know sort of having you know very strong views about how people behaved 250 years ago and it's become very fashionable now to give little lectures to criticize oh george washington you know, did, you know weren't you aware of the importance of gay marriage and you know, george washington you know what was your position on lbgtqt kind of issues mm -hmm. you know, it's almost as if we're kind of in a condescending way, reading history backwards. And instead of realizing that, you know, they've gone, that was 200 years ago, the past is the past, we live in the present, there's a clear boundary between them. We kind of very sort of uh, promiscuously destroying that very important boundary. So we can become lost in this world where the present and the past almost uh, sort of uh, surreptitiously intermesh. But don't you think that that what has happened over the past month or so that you've been describing, that that has arisen out of people being lost anyway. I, it's not they're trying to be lost. In other words, they have no sense of history. You must have had these conversations, I certainly have, with people who don't quite understand what I mean when I say, but you can't judge someone from 500 years ago what they think about LGBT, as you say, or, or slavery even, actually. You can't, you can't do that. They don't understand what you mean yeah i mean uh i think they're lost um uh, but it isn't just simply a question of not understanding it mm. uh i think that at least a section of the establishment particularly in the cultural sector is very conscious about the need to distance uh sort of uh, our communities and our people from their history to detach them from the legacy of the past. Mm. I think that there is a project that uh, has been going on for some time where you systematically call into question any redeeming feature that, for example, British history could have. So it's interesting that you kind of, uh, you know, now regard uh, Winston Churchill, who's probably a, the most significant historical symbol of Britishness, uh, and you kind of turn him into this petty criminal who uh, is single-handedly responsible for the famine in, in Bengal and who's, you know, sort of uh, is the most racist individual in the world. And you erase his role in terms of uh, mobilizing uh, society to stand up to the, you know, to the Nazis, that becomes relatively unimportant. And what you're doing in that sense is you're diminishing Britain's heroic episode during Second World War. You turn that into a kind of a mundane, a minor historical footnote. That's what it, you do. And then you do that with everything, because what you also call into question is, you know, Lincoln, you know, we used to think that Lincoln was a really good guy, you know, for abolishing civil. Now we kind of want to topple down his statue because, you know, he might have had some kind of uh, blemishes on his historical record. So what we're basically doing is creating a year zero notion of history, a year zero where anything that's possibly good begins now and it begins with the toppling of statues and it begins with, you know, getting rid of uh, labels of Aunt Jemima of, you know, sort of, uh, food packages. And anything that has proceeded before then is like the bad old days, mm. not the good old days. It's just the bad old days, nothing good about it. It's just bad. And I think that is more than just being lost. That is an attempt to uh, deprive society of its uh, signposts, its historical signposts. How seriously do you take what's been happening? 
very seriously, I think that um, uh, two things come to mind. As usual, the real problem for me is is the reaction to what's happening, mm -hmm. and the kind of moral cowardice of the authorities, mm -hmm. and the and the reluctance uh, to basically hold the line. In fact, you know, there is no line to hold as far as they're concerned because that boundary, mm -hmm. uh, even the boundary that uh, you know sort of exists between the rule of law and the breaking of law is now open 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 to question and it is quite debatable uh and you know when that occurs when you have for example uh, the police in a sense dancing with demonstrators as they did in extinction rebellion or, or taking the knee as they've done in the more recent blm demonstrations instead of behaving as police officers they basically uh pretend to be regular guys you know who have no no special responsibility for the maintenance of water. So you got on the one hand that kind of cowardly response where you, you know, at every single, I think it's probably be best personified by the Bishop, Archbishop of Canterbury, yeah. you know, just the Welby, who in a sense, you know, casually says, well, you know, we're not sure whether Jesus Christ was white. In fact, he probably wasn't white because he was born in the Middle East, you know, so, so that's the end of the discussion. And then he says, oh, we're setting up this uh, review board to decide which statues mm -hmm. can can be toppled over in our churches, mm -hmm. you know, which ones we no longer need anymore. And just like kind of out of the blue. So you have, you know, I live, I live near Canterbury, this beautiful Canterbury Cathedral with, with, with dozens and dozens of beautiful historical statues and figures. Uh, they've been there. They've been part of the cathedral for centuries. They are what makes the cathedral. And if Welby has his way, well, the cathedral is going to look like a bowling alley. There'd be so much space there when all those kind of statues are removed that you can, you might as well set up a bowling alley there because that will have more theological significance than what will be left after he's done his business. Interesting, you know, you say about the boundary between the past and the present that's broken down and, and they want to break it down. Uh, obviously, there's an old the definition, I think, of Edmund Burke came up with of society as being those who were before us, those who are now and those are in the future. Uh, that, is the, that is the whole uh, essence of a society and a nation. Um, and really in a way, that is being obliterated, is it? Because these people like Welby, they're not acting like custodians, they're acting as though they have kind of omnipotence, aren't they? they, they their judgment comes first. Yes, I mean, I, I think there's a, a phenomenal degree of uh, moral arrogance yeah. where you uh, basically look back upon what people did in the past and you you know, kind of regard them as these, you know, morally inferior beings, this kind of condescending tone yeah. towards individuals who who made history in circumstances uh, that are very different to now yeah. and who were in, nor in every respect, quite naturally, products of their time. Yeah. And instead of un understanding and, you know, and, and, and interpreting those lessons that the past has given us, you kind of write them off. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to learn from there. It's, it's simply a, a relentless series of mistakes mm -hmm. and errors uh, that were committed. And, and we're now here to fix those problems. Mm -hmm. So instead of engaging with very real problems of the present, mm -hmm. people like Welby and others are very busy mm -hmm. fixing problems that may have been thrown up two, 300 years ago. And I think that that kind of attitude uh, is one where in a sense, at least a situation where people uh, will become detached from their culture. It will encourage people to be detached from their nation, their, become detached from their communities. It's almost like we're asking people to start all over again, start yeah, anew. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's the year, year zero business. Finally, Frank, just on, on this whole trouble that's been happening, uh, I, I wonder whether you could comment on this. I, I read a very interesting piece in The Spectator recently. Uh, this week, in fact, which was saying that this isn't quite what it seems what's going on, that in fact this is a reaction by the elites to having been disagreed with in, you know, the referendum, 
uh, with Trump, the rise of populism, that somehow this is, this is not, it does feel different. I, I, I would say that myself, it feels different. But the insurrection is not about uh, economics, it's, it's not about equality, it's not about class, it's essentially anger at being disagreed with at the ballot box. Do you think there's anything in that? I think there is something in that, in that, uh, you know, people, I mean, I mean, I'm always surprised how there are people who voted for Remain and they cannot forgive people like me for supporting Brexit. I would have thought after a few months, you know, we go on live, we have a pint and we say, well, this has been done, let's, let's move on. But no, they're, they, as far as they're concerned, this has been a sin that's been committed and they're very, very angry about it. And similarly, you know, people you know, fear, fear this kind of populist mo movement that has emerged in many, many countries. Uh, they are really worried about uh, the fact that Trump managed to get elected despite their confidence that someone like him would never come anywhere near the presidency. So obviously they are very angry and sometimes even insecure. So that, that, that is very much part of this scenario. Mm. And it explains why it is that the world has become so, so polarized. Yeah. Right. There's also a little bit more than that, which is we have to remember that what we're seeing is the a new phase of the culture war. Mm. I mean, the culture war has been going on for some time now, mm. where the issues have been debated, you know, sort of and argued. And unfortunately, despite the success of populism, despite the success of Brexit, despite the fact that people voted for Trump, the other side is winning the culture war. Mm -hmm. And you can see this, I mean, just take an, an example that, that has a lot of people in America reeling over. The American Supreme Court, which is meant to have a conservative majority, which is meant to have, it's meant to be Trump's court. Yeah. That's the way people did. This court has decided last week or the week before to give new employment rights to LBGT, QT, whatever, uh, how, how many members of the alphabet are, are there kind of kind of people. And in, you know, in, I'm not against people having employment rights, but basically the, uh, this was a, a, an incredibly important judgment mm. that kind of reinforces the power and the influence of identity politics, the weaponization of identity within the workplace in America. Mm. And if that's happening on the Trump, happening under Trump, and it's happening at, uh, under the, the, the guidance and, and, and the decision of a so-called conservative Supreme Court, then you can imagine, you know, sort of what the problem is at the moment. And I think that, you know, we, you know, we are in a world where in, in Britain, very few people, there's very few of us that are prepared to say, I don't support B the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm an anti-racist, you know, and I've been anti-racist all my life. But I think the politics of BLM is wrong. You know, how many people have you heard stand up and be counted on this? Because many people deep inside know that this movement has got a lot of flaws. You know, they've got a lot of problems with it, but people are too scared to open their mouths and, 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 and raise their voices. So, you know, it is a problem that we face with and, 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 the, and the present moment, you know, sort of is one where the, the the battles, the very important battles about the soul of our community is being fought out. And I think that one side is not doing very much, you know, sort of to fight back on the on the battlefield. It's been an unbelie unbelievably weak. I mean, as somebody who was a Marxist, when Black Lives Matter is called Marxist, what is your reaction? Do you think that that is a caricature? Or, I mean, do you, what is, what, what would you call them? I wouldn't call them a Marxist. If you, if you go on their website, uh, they are a movement that has brought together different elements of identity politics. Yeah. On their website, therefore, intersectionality. They basically say that the nuclear family uh, is dubious and questionable. You know, therefore, trans rights. Therefore, all these different identity group rights. Uh, and that's really what they've done. They kind of brought that together, mm. which is, at the moment, the the main uh, medium through which the culture war is being fought by uh, essentially uh, sort of promoting you know, different identities uh, and trying to destroy the one identity that we think is important, 
which is the identity of the nation, which is the identity of being American or British or French or whatever. That's the one identity that you know, they don't subscribe to, but every single other identity is kind of put into the mix as a way of, uh, of, of imposing a new kind of set of cultural norms upon our life. Can I ask you, uh, when we finish, uh, you said we're in this stage of a culture war. We're in this, a particular stage of the culture war. Uh, what do you think the next stage would be, the way things are looking at the moment? I think for some time to come, uh, the, the battleground, the very important battleground, will be on how we view and use our legacies. You know, what kind of uh, uh, value we give to uh, our history, what kind of value we give to the institutions that have been created over the decades. How many of those institutions and how many uh, aspects of our legacy can be preserved mm. and hold on to? I think that's that's a really important uh, sort of battleground because if we lose uh, sort of the history, if we lose our past, if we forget where we come from, then I think we'll be in a very difficult position. So for me, uh, this is one of the most uh, important areas Mm. that we need to engage with and we've got to use all of our uh, resources to be able to put up a good fight and not allow the year zero uh, cultural entre entrepreneurs to win this battle i couldn't agree more uh frank thank you very very much indeed for that Th thank you for joining us today and for you. your time uh the book is why borders matter by frank Ferrady. Uh, and it's out now, uh, so please do look it up, won't you? Uh, that's all for, so what you're saying is this week, um, I'll see you next week. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you.